Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first class of comparative philosophy at the Sun Yat-sen University Chihai campus. This is the first module of the comparative philosophy lecture for the spring semester 2020. My name is Dr. Takeshi Morisato. I'll be the instructor of this course, and I will be providing the lectures on comparative philosophy this semester through this online course. Originally, we were scheduled to have this class three months ago in Chihai, and we were going to meet in person to talk about this topic of comparative philosophy. But because of our exigent circumstances, we are going to have this class online. Uh, we were also scheduled to have 20 weeks for this class, but because we are starting a little bit late in the second week of May, we are going to have only 10 to 11 weeks. I will talk about the, some of the adjustments that we have to make, uh, but this is the class that are designed last semester. And as some of you might already know, I'm providing you these lectures from Belgium. I'm currently visiting my in-laws in a small town called Turnhout, Belgium, which is located 50 kilometers away from the Dutch border. And because of the time differences, I decided to actually pre-record the lectures and send it to you. And then perhaps we can talk about some of the contents, uh, some of the contents that I will be providing in these course materials. Now, the central theme of this course is death and dying. So the title of this class is Comparative Philosophy of Death and Dying. So you may wonder, why did you come up with this most depressing theme, uh, right? There are so many different themes that you can pick up in, in the field of philosophy. Why did you even come up with this, this as a topic in this time of the world, right? So in this lecture, let me briefly explain how I came up with this theme of death and dying, and also what you are expected to do as students. In this lecture, I will have four parts. In the first part, I'll give you a little bit of introduction to the course. And in the second part, I'd like to talk about what does it count as reading philosophy? So what do you expect to do as a philosophy students when you read any philosophical texts? And then we will dive into the first segment of the first reading assignment that you have in the next class onwards. So you will know what we are doing when we are reading philosophical texts. Then always I like to end my lecture with concluding questions. In philosophy, it's much more important to come up with really good questions rather than answers. And also I like to leave you some questions that help you read the text with more critical perspective. Some of you might have difficulty understand my pronunciation. I'm not a native speaker in English, so sometimes I'm not pronouncing these words right correctly. Here we go, right? Uh, so you might actually wonder what I'm saying. To alleviate this problem, I would like to put the subtitles to these videos as we make a progress throughout the semester. It would be impossible for me to put the subtitle immediately after publishing the each lecture, but I would try to uh, solve the problem by adding subtitles later on. So if you can't understand what I'm saying, of course you can ask me uh, through email, what did you just say in this section, and I will be able to actually tell you or spell it out online. Uh, but just to let you know that uh, later on I'll put the subtitle so you'll be able to actually understand what I'm talking about. Okay, having said that, let's delve into this PowerPoint slides to understand the structure of this class, but also what are we going to do with the content. Okay, so first introduction. So as I mentioned earlier, maybe the first question we really should ask in every philosophy class is why the topic? Why the topic of death and dying? It is a strange topic indeed because I'm providing this lecture, online, online lecture material from the country that is suffering from the highest mortality rate from COVID-19 to my dear students in China, right? So it's the, we are experiencing this global pandemic. And why is it important for us to actually talk about this death and dying where we are just facing with this every day and why do we have to talk about it? I'd like to make a couple points. First of all, this class has a pre-pandemic origin. Uh, let me tell you a story how I came up with this topic. First, I was visiting uh, Mexico City. I was invited to give a talk on the notion of ecological self in the history of Japanese philosophy at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. So I gave a lecture and I spent time with my colleagues talking about this ecological self, the notion of ecology, and the notion of the self in Japanese philosophical context. And then we were spending time in San Angel, Mexico City, beautiful art galleries, right? And I'm actually looking at these paintings of Frida Kahlo and then all this uh, craftsmanship in the gift shops and coffee beans and all that. And then I was looking at this 
notion of death in Mexico. And then suddenly I was inspired to come up with this topic. And I told my colleagues that, you know what? I think what I'm going to do with this class of comparative philosophy is talk about uh, the notion of death and dying from different cultural perspectives. So I had no idea this is where we are. Uh, when I came up with this class, I didn't even expect that we'll be doing this online, first of all, and we'll be doing this at the current world situation. So I'd like to actually mention one thing, that thinker's discretion is advice to take this course. Have you ever heard this expression, viewer discretion is advice? If you don't think you're up for watching it, you shouldn't watch it. So thinker discretion advice is like, if you don't think you'll be able to think about this topic, maybe you shouldn't take this course. Now, I understand that all of you are required to take this course at this point, right? In a regular semester, you'll be able to take a course and then take that course for a couple of weeks and they say, you know what, I don't like that professor, so you change the topic, right? But in this class, you are required to take this class. But I like to mention something about philosophy. Philosophy has this ancient notion of therapeia, okay? A uh, Greek concept of therapy. Philosophy, sometimes we can talk about problems or the ways in which we think about things are problematic. We identify the problem and we try to provide solutions to that problem. And because of that, philosophy could function as a therapy. But also ancient Greek philosophers talk about this notion of philosophy as a pharmacon. Pharmacon, as you can see, is the origin of the term pharmacy. That is to say, something could become a cure or drug. So when we have a problem, we would like to have a pharmacon to solve the problem in terms of your health, right? And of course, Greek philosophers use this term to mean something more than just medicine. But this term, interestingly, has two meanings. One is the cure, restoration, or the drug that helps you recover from sickness. But it also means poison. So ancient philosophers thought that the medicine could actually function both positive and negative way. So what I'm going to say, and they did say this, the philosophy is a therapy, but it's also a pharmacon. In some cases, philosophical discussion could work in a positive way and that helps you overcome the problems, but sometimes philosophy discussion could actually put you in a more problematic path. Now, why do I say this? Is because the notion of death and dying are is such strong theme in this time of history. So if you lost someone really dear to you, right? If your family members or your friends or your friends' family members uh, passed away because of the pandemic, uh, it would be very difficult for you to take this class. And as I said again, I understand that you cannot drop this class. And if that's the case, it's okay for you to take a few weeks off or maybe you wait for four weeks and then you start watching these lectures and then prepare your presentation and complete the course. It is important to take your time. As an example, so something tragic happened in your life and then you talk about that tragedy in philosophy classes or you read the concept that it's immediately affecting your life, it's very difficult to focus because your emotion is really uh, affected by this discussion. So I would like to actually emphasize the fact that really you take your time to think about whether or not you want to take this course and if you think you need time, let me know and I can make some accommodations. But it's very important for you to contact me, so uh, please contact me or you can contact me through my TA. You can contact her and then we can actually make an arrangement. Okay, having said that, the central question that we're going to ask in this class is how do we conceive of the significance of death? Or how we can think about the notion of death in the context of comparative philosophy? Uh, in the following, I would like to give you a course structure by paying attention to the syllabus and because we are making some changes to our schedule, so I'll have to tell you what we're going to do in this class. So let's take a look at the summary of this course. So this is a syllabus that originally designed last year, in 2019, uh, Comparative Philosophy, uh, then you have the instructor's name, and here's a summary, Objective and Requirements. Let me briefly read this objective and requirements. The purpose of this course is to reflect on a philosophical theme pertinent to various intellectual traditions and to provide a comparative examination of its significance. This requires attentiveness to the similarities and differences which obtain among diverse philosophical traditions. 
The theme of this comparative course will be death and dying. Students will explore philosophical renderings of this theme drawn from ancient Mesopotamian, ancient Greek, Judeo-Christian, Indian Hindu, Chinese Confucian, Japanese Buddhism, and contemporary European and Latin American existentialist contexts. The students will then investigate the possible crossovers, mutual influences, and irreducible differences among these philosophical understandings of human finitude. During this class, students will discuss the central arguments de developed in assigned readings and reflect more deeply on their validity, soundness, and their interrelations through in-class presentations and writing assignments. By the end of the course, students should be able to articulate how a specific concept is addressed in major intellectual traditions and be capable of providing a comp comparative examination of that concept by means of cross-culturally contextualized reasoning. Now first, I will have to mention that because we only have 11 weeks instead of 20, we will have to limit the scope of our investigation. Original plan was to go around the world in different time. Right? You can see Mesopotamia to contemporary Latin American existentialism. I'm pretty sure not many people are teaching this course. And we can do this if we had 20 weeks, but with our limited human existence, we have to actually focus differently. And also, uh, we are not doing in-class presentations uh, or discussions. What I would like you to do is to prepare your presentation and upload it into the same platform, and you can share that video with the classmates. So we will watch that video. I will talk about details of how we're going to do this in the following, but I would like to make it clear at this point that you're expected to do not in class presentation, but presentation for the class through online platform. We won't be able to do the discussions either uh, because of my limited availability online. So what we're going to do is to arrange a couple sessions for Q&A. So I'll be uploading these videos and lectures to you and you upload your videos and lectures uh, presentations to me and I watch them you watch them and then every other week or maybe once in three weeks we meet together for one hour and talk about any questions and or concerns that you have and of course you can reach me via email anytime about specific issues that you might have in this class other than that, we're going to do the same. We are going to read some of the text to talk about their ideas and their interrelations and differences and sameness. And then you write your papers. So we will see that uh, in the following. So let me briefly give you the summary of the class content. The first, we will talk about how do we handle our limited existence. So how do we actually make sense of our existence, timed existence, right? We are born to this world and we will leave this world. How do we actually handle that fact that our existence is actually timed or limited? And we are also going to cultivate multicultural perspectives. It won't be as multicultural as the original plan shows, but we will have access to multicultural perspectives. Uh, also, the last phrase that I said is very important, cross-culturally contextualized reasoning. That is to say, you'll be able to see a single topic from multiple different cultural perspectives. So you'll be able to articulate the notion from one perspective, and then you'll be able to articulate also from another perspective, and then discuss how we can actually negotiate the sameness and differences, or is there anything interrelated between two different concepts? Which perspective is more comprehensible or accurate, uh, coherent in relation to the other perspectives, so on and so forth. Uh, I'll give you a list of questions that require this kind of reasoning uh, in, in, in during the class, so you don't really have to worry about what it looks like. You naturally end up cultivating this ability to think cross-culturally. Okay, before moving into the reading, let me go back to the syllabus again to give you a little bit more detailed update. So uh, we read this course objective and requirements, and then we have class schedule. I've been repeating the same thing. We are scheduled to have 20 weeks, but we only have 11 weeks or so. So what we're going to do is this. I'll give you a revised schedule, so you'll be able to see what we are going to read and what we're going to discuss in class. In principle, I'm going to talk about ancient Mesopotamian perspective. So the Epic of Gilgamesh will be in. So you have to have that book. And also, uh, we will have a Jewish perspective. 
just because our department has a Jewish thought, but also it's very important in order for us to understand Judeo-Christian tradition or the Western philosophical tradition that is grounded in Judeo-Christian tradition. So we are going to read the book of Job. And then because you belong to the philosophy department, you cannot graduate without reading all of Plato. So we are going to do Phaedo. Um, we will not cover ancient Indian or Chinese Confucian, Japanese Buddhism. And I gave a lot of thought to this because once you started to cut these things, what happened to the comparative philosophy uh, in some ways, right? We are reading mostly predominantly Middle Eastern and Western perspective. And you're right, but I think we are doing this in East Asian context. That is to say, we are from East Asia. So these perspectives are rather foreign to us rather than teaching this class or discussing this issue in North America or Europe. So to have a little bit more cross-cultural training, we're going to focus on ancient Mesopotamian, Jewish, and ancient Greek. And then we skip ancient Indian, Chinese, Japanese Buddhism. And modern European, we're going to skip Shakespeare, unfortunately. But we are going to read contemporary European perspective, that is Camus, La Peste, The Plague. So you may ask why? Um, that's a really good question. I think I, I just read the news from Japan saying that the book, The Plague, was sold 100 times more than usual during this time. Uh, I think a lot of people reading this book, and I think this book is really, um, how should I say it? I, th I think what we're going through, you'll be able to associate with the characters in this story uh, much more because of the time in which we are. So we are going to read a contemporary European perspective. And unfortunately, uh, the origin of this class, contemporary Latin American perspective, we will not be reading this book in this class. Okay, you might be disappointed at this point, right? You're the really, really passionate students who want to read all the books in the world, right? Because you're philosophy students. And also, you might feel a little bit of anger with the injustice, right? Um, you promise with this amazing syllabus with perspectives from all over the world, and then I'm giving you half of the pie. So what I'm going to do is that, look, we are going to talk about ancient Mesopotamian, Jewish, ancient Greek, and uh, contemporary European perspective in class, or that I'm going to prepare lectures for these perspectives within the time frame of the semester. But you are more than free to read these texts and write about them. Final paper that you're going to write for this class can be based on any of these texts from the syllabus. But in this lecture, within the time frame, I'll prepare only selected 10 that I mentioned. But eventually, I would like to actually upload some of the lectures on other traditions that I won't be able to talk about during this semester. So hopefully by the end of the summer, I'll have 20, 19 lectures uploaded into this online platform. So by the end of the summer, you will have the entire list of lectures that are promised in this syllabus. So this is a kind of retroactive compensation for the lack that we will suffer from this semester. Uh, if you're interested in other perspectives, you'll be able to learn through these uh, pre-recorded lectures. So the course arrangements, or the ways in which you'll be graded in this class, we are not going to pay attention to the class participation. I just simply expect that you watch this lecture in a good time with the full attention and you read your books with the best of your capacity. So you don't have to worry about that. What I need is, as I mentioned earlier, is presentation. So instead of in-class presentation pertaining to the reading assignments, what I like you to do is to prepare 10 minutes video of you presenting what in whatever form you want. To present me the idea that you actually discover from reading the text. So some of you might be able to actually prepare the presentation in exactly the same way as I'm doing. Or you can ask your friend or your family members to hold the phone and you talk to the phone about your presentation. Or you can make any clips uh, if you're really good at computer or filmmaking. It doesn't matter. You just need to give me 10 minutes presentation that you can upload into the online platform and I'll give you instruction for how to upload. What I need is a two people every week uploading the videos. I think if we wait too long, we'll run out topics. So it should be done in a timely manner. That is to say, if I'm going to talk about Epic of Gilgamesh in the second week, two people are going to upload the videos of them presenting some ideas in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh in relation to 
the reading assignments that you get for that week. Does that make sense? Uh, so let's say we are reading one to tablet one to three of Epic or Gilgamesh for the next week. Two of you are going to give a presentation on any ideas that you can discover from the reading assignment. Make a video out of it and upload it into online platform. I'll watch it. Everybody else is going to watch it. And then we can comment uh, later on in a Q&A session. Now for a midterm essay and a final exam, it doesn't really make sense for us to have a midterm essay since it's already a midterm into it. We only have 11 weeks, so it, it, it looks more like a quarter term, right? So what we're going to do is I'm going to assign you a single paper, the final paper at the end of the semester. So that would count as a 60%. And then I would grade your presentation as a 40%. So you have a 60%, 40%, two assignments. One presentation, one essay. Now, it would be intimidating for you to write an essay, one essay, and you will be graded based on that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to give you a two segments for the writing essay. First, I'll give you a kind of question in the middle of the semester by anticipating while you'll be asked for the final essay. Okay, so what we're going to do is the first, I'll give you a kind of a list of questions that you can answer for the first draft. And then the final essay, I'll give you the question that you can use to expand the first paper. Um, it makes more sense once you see it. Maybe you would have some questions. I basically give you a list of questions for the first maybe five weeks into this semester. And then you write essay based on that. And then I can take a look at your essays and I can correct some of the things and I give you suggestions, improve your writing, improve your essay, and then I give you the final paper topics and you can pick them to combine what you have written for the middle of the semester. Okay, again, you're not required to write the first draft. If you're confident, you said, you know, I'm going to wait until the end of the semester, look at the questions and I'm going to answer it. You're more than welcome to do that. But if you're not confident to format your papers correctly or, or you're not confident with your English, I highly recommend you to write and rewrite continuously for this class. So instead of having the final paper at the end of the semester and you kind of pressure to do this, I can give you a two-step approach. First, I can give you a set of questions. You can answer them. And then I can give you a second set of questions. And that requires answering the first set. So you'll be able to actually progressively improve your writing for the semester. So in a nutshell, I'm giving you 40% for the presentation and 60% for the final exam. But it will be arranged in such a way that you will not be intimidated by these percentage. Now, I'm not entirely sure if I'm allowed to change course arrangements. I need to actually double check with the department. Uh, I'm assuming that we could actually modify some because the schedule is different. Uh, if not, I'll get back to you again and we will have to actually do all of these things that I indicated in the first version. But for now, I'm going to provide you these options that we are doing the 40% video presentation, online video presentation, and then 60% final exam. Again, with asterisk. Okay, so just give me a week or two to get back to you with the exact information about this. Other than that, I think the syllabus is quite straightforward. Uh, it's very short and sweet. So let's move back to the PowerPoint slides. Okay, now we are moving on to the second section of reading. Uh, as a philosophy student, I think you are third year uh, philosophy students. And if I look at the course roster, 90% of you are actually philosophy major. Since you've been studying philosophy for, for three years, uh, you should be able to answer the questions. Uh, what is philosophy? Right? What are you actually doing as a philosophy student? Do you ever have this problem when you go home during the break and all your relatives and cousins ask you questions? So what do you study at the university? Oh, I study philosophy. And they say, what the heck is that? Right? Do you find it really easy to actually explain what philosophy is or what we're doing when we, when we are reading philosophical texts? I think answer is very difficult, actually. You know, in fact, many of us actually graduate with the philosophy degrees with the really vague idea of what philosophy is. So I can give you a little bit of guideline here to talk about, okay, like I'm getting, giving you the list of the books that I'm expecting you to read for this class, but then, you know, this selection might look quite different from all the other professors' selections, right? I don't know what other professors are actually providing you, but I expect that some of them giving you articles 
scholarly papers or classical philosophy books from modern philosophy, for instance. And they would probably look quite different from what I'm actually requiring you to read. So before I start this class, I'd like to talk about a little bit of philosophy of reading or the question of what does it mean for us to read anything as philosophy students or philosophy scholars. So the question we have to ask is this, what is it like to read philosophically? When we read anything as a philosophy student, what are we doing, right? So that's the basic question. What am I expected to do when I'm given these reading assignment and what am I looking for? What's the right questions and what, what's the right answers? And since you've been studying philosophy for three years, you probably naturally have this knowledge, but you haven't really paid attention to what you've been doing yet. So let me give you a little bit of methodological reflection here. In philosophy, I like to say is that the most important thing for you as undergraduate students of philosophy is to read the primary sources. So anything that considered to be philosophical by philosophy professors, you should read it. And then forget about secondary sources, and especially in a bachelor's, bachelor's degree. What the secondary sources do to the primary sources that they tell you, this is how I read the primary sources, and these are the implications and the questions that I can draw from primary sources. But what you should be doing as undergraduate students is to cultivate your intellectual capacity to decipher what's in the primary sources. The purpose of secondary source is to give you some guideline or a kind of interpretational tools, right? So the scholar read this text, let's say Plato's Republic, you're reading famous scholars reading of Plato's Republic and he tells you, this is what I found in reading this text. Once you do that, and then you look at Plato's text next time, you end up actually having the same visions as the scholar. And it's sometimes great if the scholar is a very good scholar, but then not all scholars are perfect. They might actually miss something important. And what is most important for you as the undergraduate students of philosophy is to actually read philosophical texts by yourself and try to come up with your own interpretation that raises questions and then come up with your own answers to them. So it is, absolutely vital for you to spend more time with the primary sources. So I'm assigning you the Epical Gilgamesh, Book of Job, and all the other texts, but I don't expect you to read any secondary sources whatsoever. Just read these texts and tell me what you think about them. Also, we have to think about this ambivalent forms of philosophy. So when we say, what is philosophy? We expect it to give determinate form of what counts as a philosophy. But I'm saying that it's very uh, vague or highly controversial. For instance, you have literature and philosophy distinction. So something counts as literature and something counts as a philosophy. And then sometimes you have poetic language, especially in the field of literature, you read poetry, something is written poetically. And in a discipline of philosophy, you have treatises, essays that make arguments and points. And then you have uh, culturally particular perspective the, in the side of literature and then philosophy tried to get at the universal truth so somehow transcultural perspective or universal idea that we're trying to get to the philosophy now these are the usually distinctions that we draw but these distinction is quite vague what do i mean by this think about nietzsche his writings is incredibly poetic they are not written in the, in the style of treatise and in fact he would despise the idea of a universal ideal, idealism, right? Uh, Kierkegaard, any existentialist the same way, Camus, Dostoevsky, their works cannot possibly be read as an essay, but they do make philosophical point. So these distinctions that we tend to hold in relation to the text, so the, you know, something counts as literature, some, something counts as a philosophy, it really doesn't matter. What I'm saying is that these distinctions are not always quite clear, and in fact, many literature and poetic texts can be read philosophically. Especially, you have this capacity to read any text with the layers. So what I'm really saying is that we can't give a fixed picture or definition of what philosophical texts look like, but we can give you a description of what it is like to read any text philosophically and turn them into the content of philosophy. So 
We can read literature philosophically. We can read poetry philosophically. We can read any culturally specific text in context of philosophy. This is what we're going to learn from this comparative philosophy: is to read them by paying attention to the ways in which we read them. And to do that, you have to be able to read them in layers, or you have to be able to pay attention to the levels of interpretation when we read any text in the context of philosophy. So let me give you these levels of interpretation in the following as a tentative description of what we do as a philosophy student, or what we do in philosophy classes when we read any text, intellectual text in the context of philosophy. What is really important in philosophy is to pay attention to these levels of interpretation. Actually, this is not my idea; it is very ancient idea. But the most famous person who emphasized these levels of interpretation is this person. Does anyone know who this is? This is Dante Alighieri, very famous Renaissance Italian poet slash philosopher. You can see Dante's Divine Comedy and Inferno in the background. Um, if I had a thirty weeks in this class, I would have read his Divine Comedy as well. But since we had only twenty, we d- I decided to cut him out, and then we have a ten. So I only mentioning him in the beginning of the semester. But it's incredibly important when you think about philosophical reading. The picture was a little too big, so let me give you a smaller picture. So Dante Alighieri from thirteenth century, thirteenth to fourteenth century Italy. Uh, he's famous writer of the Divine Comedy. Uh, there's another text, famous text that he wrote. is called the Co- the Convivio. It's written in the beginning of 14th century. It is the Italian word for the banquet. Dante says that there are four levels of interpretation. First level is literal, and second level is allegorical, and third level is moral. And I like to say, in the context of philosophy, it's a philosophical concepts or conceptual level. And then the third, he calls it anagogical level. So let me briefly take you to the text, the Convivio, where he talks about this, and then give you what does he mean by these levels of interpretation or layers of reading. So when you read a text, Dante is saying, you have to be reading them in four different levels. So your professor give you a reading assignment and say you read from page twenty-five to fifty. You go home, you read once, you come back and say tell you what's written. That is not what Dante is asking you to do. He wants you to actually analyze the text in four different levels, and then come back to me and tell me what was actually going on in that text. And I'm saying that the philosopher should be able to do these four different levels, or at least first three. And let me briefly show you what Dante means by these four levels of interpretation in the Convivio. This is a website called the Digital Dante from the、uh, Columbia University, and they have this free text of the Convivio online. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to access this. If not,、uh, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to track the convivio at the university library. But I'm actually using this digital Dante for this lecture.、Uh, this is the book two. So he gave whole talk about something else in the book one, and then he goes on to talk about other things in book two. Book two, chapter one. Then he goes into this really poetic language of how I started the the banquet of literary explorations. And then the second paragraph, he says something like this: As I stated in the first chapter, this exposition must be both literal and allegorical. To convey what this means, it is necessary to know that writing can be understood and ought to be expounded principally in four senses. If you're going to say you read a text, you have to be reading them in four different levels. The first is called literal, and this is the sense that does not go beyond the surface of of the letter, as in the fables of the poets. So the literal sense is. Literally, just reading the lines, so you know what each word means, right? You'll be able to tell me what the sentence actually means. That's the literal level. Since we're doing philosophy in a second language or third language,、uh, if you don't speak English as as your native language, we struggle here the most, right?、Uh, we don't necessarily understand every word that professors say in English. When we read English text, we have to use dictionary. So the most of the struggle for students from East Asia to read any English text is this literal level, like what these words mean. And then he says the next is called allegorical. That is the one that is hidden beneath the cloak of these fables, and is the truth hidden beneath a beautiful fiction? 
Thus, Ovid says that with his lyre, Ophius tamed wild beasts and made trees and rocks move toward him, which is to say that the wise man with the instrument of his voice makes cruel hearts grow tender and humble and moves to his will those who do not devote their lives to knowledge and art, and those who have no rational life whatsoever are almost like stones. So Dante is saying that with a literal level, the words just describe a scene, like Ovid is describing the scene in which Ophius moves wild beasts and trees and rocks toward him with his music. Right? But that scene symbolizes something else. So beyond the literal level, what is hidden in the literal level, or what lies beyond the literal level, is the symbolic meaning. This is something that we have to practice in philosophy. So you read the line, but then you have to tell me what these scenes or what these lines actually imply, what they tell us beyond the literal level. So that's the second layer that you, we have to have. Why this kind of concealment was devised by the wise will be shown in the penultimate book. Indeed, the theologians take this sense otherwise than do the poets. But since it is my intention here to follow the method of the poets, I shall take the allegorical sense according to the usage of the poets. So he's saying that these four levels of interpretation go back to ancient reading of the Bible. So theologians, when they talk about Bible, they said four different levels of reading. And then he's saying as a poet, we have a four levels of reading in the poetry. Now I'm saying philosophers do the same. We're reading four levels of reading in philosophy. So let's take a look at the third sense. The third sense is called moral right here. This is a sense that teachers should intently seek to discover through the scriptures for their own profit and that of their pupils. As for example, in the gospel, we may discover that when Christ ascended the mountain to be transfigured of the twelve apostles, he took with him but three. The moral meaning of which is that in matters of great secrecy, we should have few companions. In other words, what he's saying is that any writings in poetry and I'm saying many writings in philosophy have a literal sense, and then you have to interpret the symbolic meaning of these literal sense. But these symbolic meanings actually give us concepts. And Dante is saying that this is moral concepts. And I'm saying that is philosophical concepts. So not only you have to be perfect in the literal, you have to be able to read allegory or symbols from that literal sense. And then you have to be able to articulate what are the concepts that these scenes or these allegories or symbolisms are implying. And then this mysterious fourth level, the fourth sense is called an anagogical, that is to say, beyond the senses. In a nutshell, uh, Dante is saying that once you read a poetry or theological text, after you go through three senses, you enter this fourth sense where you actually experience existential transformation. That's basically what he's saying here. But let me briefly point out this important factor. He says, in this kind of explication, so in this process of reading the text, literal should always come first as being the sense in whose meaning the others are enclosed and without which it would be impossible and illogical to attend to other senses. So higher senses like moral concepts or anagogical transformation of the self are more important. But he's saying, unless you get the first two right, literal and allegorical sense, you won't get to the concepts. So he's saying that you really have to build up your capacity to read literal sense. So you have to improve your vocabulary, right? You have to know the English grammar well enough to be able to understand what's going on in these texts. And then you have to cultivate your capacity to read allegories and symbolisms. And then you have to be able to provide us with the concepts that you see in these scenes. Dante says, this is the ways in which you can read philosophical text. And let's go back to the slide. So, the four levels of interpretation by Dante. This is the ways in which we would approach the uh, reading assignment in this semester. But remember, Dante said the function of the teacher and the benefit of the students is the moral sense. In other words, I'll be able to judge up until the third level. It would be great if you read philosophical books and then you experience this existential transformation and decided to live better life. Uh, but it's not something that I can judge or it's not mine to judge according to Dante. The function of teacher is to evaluate the first three level. 
Are you writing, reading the text correctly in a grammatical sense? Or are you correctly drawing the allegories and symbolism from the text? And whether or not your moral and philosophical concepts that you draw from the, these readings are accurate. So in this class, we are focusing first three levels. But again, I think most of us will be struggle here, literal and allegorical level. Uh, I'm not expecting you to be able to lay out whole concepts, range of concepts by reading one text. If you can get to the one idea from reading one text, that's great. But most of us will be struggling between literal and an allegorical level. I'm quite aware of that. So don't be intimidated that you have to be able to do these four levels of interpretation immediately. Uh, I'm saying that in this class, I'll be judging primarily on first three levels. And then most of the time, we will be discussing at the first two levels. But this is like how to read anything philosophically according to Dante. So hopefully you look something like this when you read the text that I'm providing in this class, right? You're holding several different books and trying to figure out what's being written, trying to figure out the symbolisms and allegories. And this is the picture of Dante. And hopefully you're going to look like Dante when you read these texts. Now, don't worry about these uh, links to these materials. I'll definitely provide you uh, follow-up links and information about where you can find these texts. Uh, it is just to give you an idea that uh, when you read texts in philosophy, it's not just one layer of information that transmitted from point A to point B. So there's idea that I have and I give it to you. No, that's not how philosophy works. Philosophy is like giving you something to read and ask a couple questions to spark your multi-layer reading. So that's what we're doing in philosophy. You have to become somebody who can read between the lines. You have to be, become somebody that will be able to actually see something more than what you see at the surface. Okay, so it's, it's not a superficial reading, but it is going to be layered and a profound reading that you practice in philosophy. So let's see how we can do that with ancient Mesopotamian literature that we're going to read in the beginning of this class. Uh, just to give you a sample of how we can do this four levels of interpretation, in relation to reading assignment, and then I would like to quickly end with concluding questions. Okay. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the first reading assignment for your class, your book should look like this. The official title is The Epic of Gilgamesh, the Babylonian Epic Poem and Other Texts in Akkadian and Sumerian, translated with an introduction by Andrew George. So we'll be reading Andrew George's interpretation of Excuse me. We'll be reading Andrew George's in translation of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, uh, what is the Epic of Gilgamesh? It is ancient Mesopotamian literature. This is the earliest surviving body of literature in humanity. Apparently the second oldest religious text. It consists of Sumerian poems. But as you can see from the subtitle of the book, it's Babylonian epic poem and other texts in Agadian and Sumerian. So Epic of Gilgamesh already consists of multicultural perspective of Akkadian and Sumerian civilization. Excuse me, Akkadian and Sumerian languages. Interestingly, uh, page 16 in introduction, Andrew George talks about how the Epic of Gilgamesh itself is already uh, the product of multicultural experience or life experience. He says the northern language was Akkadian and southern language of the elites are Sumerian. And these languages actually shaped the Epic of Gilgamesh. So you have to actually read both poems, not only the Sumerian original version, but also Akkadian version to be able to construct Epic of Gilgamesh. And then he compares that situation to the modern day Belgium, right? Northern part of Belgium speak Dutch or Flemish and southern part of the country speak French, which was long time considered to be the language of the elites. So something like that. I highly recommend you to read the introduction. Of course, if you don't have a time, you can just read the story. But sometimes it gives you a perspective of what you're reading, uh, at least gives you a historical context in which this story was made. Uh, so it's very important to read the historical introduction. Uh, but it's not uh, required reading. So it is an literature of ancient Mesopotamian civilization, Sumerian poems. The story is telling us about, or it was actually told in the time of the third dynasty of U. And when was that dynasty around, right? That's around 2100 BC. So it's about 4,120 years ago. This story was told, or the story is telling us about 4,120 years ago, ancient Mesopotamia. It's a long time ago. 
And because of this temporal distance from today to the past, the text suffer from incredible fragmentation. For instance, this text consists of 3,000 lines, but out of 3,000 lines, 575 lines are missing. So one-sixth of the text or more is missing from the story. Uh, so you can imagine, when you read this story, it's almost like you can feel this kind of dream state where not everything is absolutely clear. There's a lot of missing link. You know, sometimes you have a really elaborate dream, but when you wake up, you don't really remember the details. And then you spend the rest of the day, right, with your friends, your families, or you go to school, whatever. And then eventually, like, bits and pieces of that long, elaborate dream comes back. Reading the Epic of Gilgamesh is almost like that dream state that you're reading something, something is repeated, something is missing, something reappears. It is actually fragmentary, but it's almost like having a dream. That's the kind of reading that you can get from reading the Epic of Gilgamesh. So I like to pay attention to the beginning of the story in the following, but before doing that, I'd like to give you a little bit of tip to what you should pay attention to when you read any classical stories in the context of philosophy. When you read a classical poetry or philosophical text that is not written in a matter of treatise where there's a single author and a he or she is going to tell you what he or she thinks. If you read a Republic, Plato's Republic, you have so many characters, right? names. What is really important is to have this first few pages, okay? Because, okay, you heard the Third Dynasty of War. You don't even know where that is. Right? You pretended that, oh yeah, professor is saying this, so let's just act like we know what he's talking about, right? No, we have to actually pay attention to where they are, when it, it took, when it took place, so on and so forth. So it's very important that you have at least these four pages of introductory material and a chronology and glossary. Okay, these three things you should print out and have it with you as you read. Uh, what happens often is like these pages actually in the beginning or back of the book and you have to flip back and forth. It's quite annoying. So what I really suggest you to do is print them out or read them on PDF version so you can jump back and forth without interrupting your reading. Okay, so ancient Sumerian civilization is present there, Iraq, the Baghdad right here. And then you have Tigris Euphrates River the beginning of human civilization, right? Ancient Sumerian civilization was here. And then third dynasty of Ur, right? There's a town of Ur. And then Epic of Gilgamesh about Uruk, the city of Uruk is right here. So basically the story is about here, ancient Sumerian. And then when was the third dynasty of Ur? We saw the 2100,000, uh, 2100 BC. So this is a time chart in the beginning of the book, you should pay attention to this. So 2,000, 3,000 years ago, early city-states of Sumer, Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, was 2,800 Iran, and 2,800 BC, king of Uruk, invention of writing Sumerian tablets, Gilgamesh deifying God's list, all the Akkadian empire, which influenced the Akkadian language to come into the story, oral Gilgamesh poems in, in Sumerian Akkadian language, question mark, the oldest copy of Sumerian Gilgamesh poem was from 2100 BC. Okay, so this is the copy, first copy of the Sumerian Gilgamesh poem. Uh, then many copies of the Sumerian Gilgamesh, Akkadian fragments discovered in 1750 BC, uh, Middle Babylonian version, so on and so forth. And this is the most important here. Andrew George argued that Sinliqua Yunini edition. This is a white magician from 1200 BC. He constructed Babylonian epic uh, version of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And Andrew George argues that the current version of the Epic, epic of Gilgamesh that we have, the complete version of the Epic of Gilgamesh, is made by this white magician. How great is that? Sinlik Unini. Uh, this is the white magician provided this epic in 1200 BC. And then you can see how the history of civilization at the same time. So you, you kind of have to have this historical context in the background when you read this text, okay? So you should have it with you. Um, also, it's very important for you to remember names. These are important characters, right? This is why 
Andrew Jo is providing you the list of names. And you should really think about why he listed these names because they play symbolically significant role in the story. Okay, so you need to have these names memorized. And then glossary of proper nouns. There's a lot of names that kind of show up in, in Epic and you don't know what they mean. So it's very important to go into these details. For instance, let me give you one example. Okay, what I want is seven sages, legendary figures in Babylonian mythology who were sent by the god Ea at the beginning of history to civilize mankind. Seven sages, remember that? Ea, what is Ea? Right here, the god of the fresh water ocean below. The wisest of the gods, he is adept in every skill and finds solution to every problem. His expertise enabled the mother goddess to create mankind, whom he civilized and saved from the wrath of Enlil. And then you go on and on. But it's important, at this point you already know, seven sages, legendary figures that created the human civilization, sent by Ea. Ea is the god of fresh water, the wisest god that provides solution to the problems. Also, he's involved with the creation of mankind. Okay, so remember these two terms. Then, uh, let's try to look at the actual text. Right? You, you think reading philosophy text is really easy, but you see this is really time-consuming. This is what we're going to do when we read philosophy text. Okay, let's go back to the philosophical text. So, let's take a look at the overture of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Tablet 1 is entitled The Coming of Enkidu. Isn't it interesting how the beginning of the story about Gilgamesh is not about Gilgamesh, but it's immediately written as Enkidu? By the way, Enkidu is mentioned as one of the important characters, so remember that when you read these first segments. The Epic of Gilgamesh opens like this. He who saw the deep, the country's foundation, who knew, was wise in all matters. Gilgamesh who saw the deep, the country's foundation, who knew, was wise in all matters. Let's keep going. He everywhere and learned of everything, the sum of wisdom. He saw what was secret, discovered what was hidden. He brought back a tale of before the deluge. Now, you might notice many things. Repetitions, the most dominant feature is this ellipses, the dot dot dot, right? These are called lacuna or lacune. It's fragments, it's missing portions. Remember, like 557 lines are missing from this epic. So you have these lines that are just kind of distance past, didn't survive the test of the time. And because you're reading this stone tablet, okay, when I say tablet, it's not the beautiful tablet that you're holding right now with this beautiful flat screen and it's getting thinner and thinner every year, right? No, the tablet is something like this. It's stone, right? So it's almost like you're dropping your tablet during your bicycle ride and you drop in a puddle, and it can only show you the 3,000 lines, and a part of your screen is broken, so you can read the whole thing. That's the experience of having ancient Mesopotamian tablet. You're missing lines. So you're holding this story, but you can't really get to some of the parts. So you have to really enjoy this form of a presentation of the ancient epic of Gilgamesh. So you have to really feel this sort of fragmentation from reading this, these lines, okay? What can you tell me by reading these two stanzas? First, you recognize repetition. He who saw the deep. Gilgamesh who saw the deep. Country's foundation. Wise in all matters. There's a kind of repetitions. What does that repetition actually symbolize? Also, the depth, the deep. What kind of deep is this? It is just, it's not like a swimming pool and looking at the depth of the swimming pool, right? There's some kind of depth that they're talking about. What does the depth symbolize? Uh, he everywhere learned of everything. He gained some of wisdom. So Gilgamesh is considered to be the wisest, right? Because he saw the abyss or something of the depth. He saw what was secret, discovered what was hidden. He brought back a tale before the deluge. Deluge is the flood. It's this theme that occurs in many ancient stories. The most famous one is Noah's Ark. There's a flood, there's a break in history. So immediately, this wisest figure that learned everything, he had the sum of wisdom, and he brought back something before the time of deluge, which actually introduces the break in narrative or break in history. 
So with the first two lines, you already have to feel this kind of break between the storyteller and listener. So you have to be able to actually pick that up from just reading first stanzas, okay? And then, he came a far road, was very fond peace, and set all his labors on a tablet of stone. He built the rampart of a rook, the sheepfold of Holy Eana, sacred storehouse. So he brought back some wisdom and he built this foundation or rampart of Uruk the sheepfold. Remember the Uruk is a city? And then he set all his labors on the tablet of stone. Let's keep reading. See its wall like a strand of a wall. View its parapet that none could copy. Take the stairway of a bygone era. Draw near to Eana, seat of Ishtar the goddess that no later king could ever copy. Ishtar is the goddess of the Uruk, so she is the center of the city, as you can see in a letter describing the city. Climb Uruk's wall and walk back and forth, survey its foundation, examine the brickwork. Were its bricks not fire in an oven? Did the seven sages not lay its foundations? Remember the seven sages? We look at the glossary, that is the people, legendary figures that gave us the foundation for civilization. So did the seven sages not lay its foundations? Didn't they give us the foundation for this Uruk built by Gilgamesh? A square mile is a city, a square mile they grove, a square mile is a clay pit, half a square mile the temple of Ishtar. Three square miles and a half is the Uruk's expanse. So you hear about Gilgamesh, hear about this city, and he ends something like this. See the tablet box of Seder release its clasp of bronze. Lift the lid of its secret, pick up the tablet of Lapis Leslie, and read out the travails of Gilgamesh, all that he went through. So you can feel, right? I said, look, these ellipses describe this fragmentation of this text. Now, the beginning of the text is telling us something about the Gilgamesh, who is the wisest of all, and brought back the story before the deluge. Then the lines continue to tell us about the civilization that he found after bringing back the story by seeing the depth. And then he ends with this stanza, at least in this opening segment. See the tablet box of Seder, release its clasp of bronze, lift the lid of its secret, pick up the tablet of lapis lazuli, and read out the tra travails of Gilgamesh, all that he went through. So what is happening here is that you expect it to be holding this tablet, stone tablet, they're telling us the story about the Epic of Gilgamesh and you are participating in this story. Or at least narrative is telling you to hold this stone and read it. This is what Gilgamesh went through. Even from these lines, we'll be able to actually draw the implications that there's a kind of big event that broke the history in a half before and after Deluge. And Gilgamesh is described as the wisest of all the who found the foundation of the civilization of or the city of Uruk. Okay, so by reading first a few stanzas, you have to be able to already pick up these kind of things if you're a philosophy student. You can't just read the lines and just, okay, I read it, so professor tell me what I should remember and what, what I should write down in exams. No, that's not what we do in philosophy. In philosophy, we are trying to pick up the symbolisms. So trying to pick different parts and try to come up with the reasons to connect them so this is something that I would like you to actually do as you read the first section of Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, I'll tell you about the reading assignment to my TA so you'll be able to hear from her which section you should be reading for next in the next class and then we will arrange the two presenters. But at the end of this lecture, I'd like to end with the questions that might help those who have to actually present to think about the content of what they're going to talk about. And also I'm going to talk about some of them in the following lectures. Okay, concluding questions. So I think you're already bombarded with this information about four levels of reading, right? Your reading capacity has to increase from now on, right? And then you saw how we can actually practice that with uh, first segments of the Epic of Gilgamesh. So I'd like to end with the questions that I would like you to think about when you read the Epic of Gilgamesh. First question is this, what is the function of the first line? When you read classical text, especially ancient text, let's say from pre-Socratic writing up until Augustine, or sometimes even read some of the medieval texts, the first line or first segments are incredibly important. So don't read them as like crappy introduction, 
But they are trying to tell you something really important. They're trying to actually weave more meaning than you can ever imagine. So when they actually made this stone tablet and started to invent the writing and tell you something, hold this tablet, read this story. They're trying to tell you something really important, okay? So keep that in mind. What does the function of the first line and think about this as you read through the Epic of Gilgamesh. What does the creation of Enkidu signify? So the rest of the tablet one onwards is going to talk about the coming of Enkidu. What does this character mean? What does this character mean and what does the creation of this character actually mean in the story? Another question is this, what is the relation of human and nature according to the ancient Mesopotamian worldview? How do they actually envision the relationship between human and nature? Is there a kind of a rapport between them? Or is there a kind of a break? What's the relationship between human, nature, and divine? So how do they interact with each other? These are something that you should really pay attention to when you read ancient philosophical texts. What's the role of Shemhat? This is a really, really fascinating character when you read the epical Gilgamesh. It is the priestess and a prostitute, and it's listed as one of the most important characters in the story in the beginning of the introductory text in the list of characters. So pay attention to what does the role of Shem had. She appears and disappears rather quickly. What is her role, and why is it so important in this story that Andrew George had to actually pick up as one of the important characters? So these are the things that you could actually think about when you prepare the presentations or when you actually read these texts carefully. Okay. On that note, I'd like to finish this first lecture on a comparative philosophy of death and dying. I hope I gave you a little bit of an overview of what you expected to do. And of course, I would have to give you a little bit more details to, uh, about the course arrangements and reading assignments, so on and so forth. But hopefully it gave you an outline of what we are going to do in this semester. Also gave you some idea of what it is like for us to read philosophically and then gave you a taste of the beginning of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Okay, if you have any questions or concerns or ideas or suggestions, feel free to actually comment or send them through messages or email. Thanks for attending to this lecture till the end. I'm looking forward to discussing with these ideas with you and see you next week.